Well, hello and welcome to the Startups of London podcast. I'm your host, Ozan, and today on this hot British summer Friday, we have Dalston's on the show, which is a startup in the drinks industry. Uh, I'm joined by the founder, Duncan. Hello, Duncan. Good morning, Ozan. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me introduce the business uh, because I have your website open and you describe yourself as sparkling water blended with real squeezed fruit, no refined sugar, no artificial sweeteners, and all natural. So my first question to you, how are people's drinking habits changing over the last few years? What's your observation? So I would say that the soft drinks industry has been in a state of chaos uh, uh, recently. Uh, and this is also affecting the, the alcohol space. And obviously there is always opportunity in chaos. Um, there have been two major movements. One is craft. So you'll probably be aware of craft beer, the rise of craft breweries. Especially with Brewdog, right? They're, they're a big high they're, value to start. They're at the forefront. They, they've, they, they were a, um, sort of a first mover here in the UK and have been phenomenally successful, uh, although lots of recent controversy. Um, if you've been following that. No, I haven't actually. They they had um, some issue with uh, disgruntled former employees uh, signing, a, signing a joint letter, but it's possibly something that only really makes the uh, um, the industry news wires. But um, oh, I see. They, they had a sort of a bit of a backlash, but I mean, they're a, um, they're they're an extremely impressive company. That I'm Scottish, by the way, and they've done a lot for mm. Scottish business, uh, and they've really pushed the, the the craft beer industry on in the UK. So you've had this craft movement, particularly in the alcohol world. And actually, when we set up Dalston's, we thought um, uh, that was our analogy. We thought, right, we're going to become the UK's uh, craft soda producer. Um, what's happened, actually, is that there are two larger trends that we see in, um, in soft drinks in particular, uh, and those are health and sustainability. So with things like the sugar tax coming in a few years ago um there has been a drive to remove calories from soft drinks um and remove sugar and we actually went and removed all refined sugar from our drinks in 2020 uh, and i'm really happy with the range where the range is now but this has been we've been constantly reformulating in response to this sort of chaos in the industry uh, and the drive to make soft drinks healthier uh, as you know we have a, a, a perhaps a slightly obesogenic food system and certainly a, pro a problem um, a, a problem with um, obesity in, in certainly in Western society uh, and governments and campaigning organizations are agitating to, to make changes in the food system that we have. So we have to be responsive to that. We have to listen to that. There's another overarching trend, which is the no low movement, which is people moving away from alcohol. Uh, people wanting to have, again, I'd see it as part of health, but it's created a, a new categories of drinks and it's sort of upended the soft drinks world. So it's, I think, possibly previously, the soft drinks world was perhaps not the most exciting um, of industries, dominated by some large players, of course. Um, but actually, in recent years, it's become rather more interesting as a result of all of these changes. Indeed. And I think it's very interesting in the sense that I look at my personal preference uh, in, in drinks uh, as, as a consumer and I find myself, okay, I have to limit my caffeine intake. Uh, I have to limit my alcohol intake. I don't want to take um, unrefined sugars. Um, I don't want to drink this and that because it's not healthy. But the problem is, uh, what am I going to drink? Am I going to drink water all day? <laughs> so that's kind of the dilemma I find myself in. So. I'm looking for a healthy, uh, delicious beverage alternative uh, throughout the day. And I feel this is similar for a lot of people. So I think there's a new space opening up for new type of drinks. Is that is that how you see it? Do you think that's accurate? Do you see a different picture in there? I think you're absolutely right. And this probably is like uh, my head of marketing might sort of um, beat me about the head with the rolled up newspaper of this because it's not exactly sort of marketing friendly language but the way i see it is i want a drink which i can really enjoy but which i'm not going to like hate myself for afterwards right um and that's what we're trying to make now 
one of the things I find really interesting in food and drink and actually in startups in general is seeing uh, what translates from uh, America to um, Western Europe. So there's often this idea that trends in the States kind of come around here, but five years later, at least I think people used to think like that. I don't know if that's really always the case. And one of them, uh, one of these trends, which we've been watching closely is what we've called the seltzer market. Now, mm. there, there is recently uh, the boom of what, what are called hard seltzers and alcohol. But before that, we've had uh, the rise of the seltzers, which really is sort of an alternative to soda. It's very low calorie. It's this health way of drink. Now, my impression is that the British public in particular are really into great tasting drinks. They want things that taste nice, basically. Yeah. They're yeah. not really willing to compromise on that. Um, I think I've. you see a lot of NPD, I, I think last year or 2019 in the UK, I think there were over a thousand new drinks launches, for example. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, there's a lot of NPD happening all the time. What we what what I've really seen though is that uh, it's the the companies and the drinks that focus on great taste that seem to be winning over here still. So you've got to balance these trends. You've got to balance the the drive for health, uh, which you sort of seem to like totally person, personally recognise. You've got to balance that with making something that tastes not tastes nice. Basically, we've been really kind of treading that line uh, over the last few years. And I'm really happy we landed. So we're around the sort of 40 calorie per can mark uh, and all natural, no refined sugar. So yeah, I, 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 if I haven't already, I need to send you some of our drinks. Uh, I was actually just on your um, website trying to order the lemon soda. It was saying 23 pounds. I was thinking that's expensive. And then I realized it's for a 24 pack. So I was just about to order it. Uh, but I cannot see the delivery dates. Um, uh, but uh, I'll try to finish that step. And uh, perhaps, I don't know, uh, being able to buy in uh, smaller uh, batches could be uh, more relevant for for people who would like to try out your first brand. I don't know, do you have kind of a uh, a discovery pack with different uh, ing- different flavors? We do. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a 12 can variety pack. And, oh, yeah, that's perfect uh, for me then. I'll try that one. We've also got a, we've got a five can taster pack coming out very soon as well. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll either do the five taster pack or the 12 variety pack and try because this is something I'm, I'm I, li- I like the idea. And for the audience who's listening, I go to dalstons.com and you'll see on the top uh, their uh, online shop and you can you can order from there. Uh, and I think this is the problem you mentioned is kind of like a uh, industrial engineering optimization problem, isn't it? Because there are a lot of dimensions in terms of uh, sugar, caloric intake, uh, sweeteners, uh, alcohol, caffeine, uh, what you put in, what you leave out, and still optimize the flavor, the flavorings, the color. It's it's a it's a tough problem. So uh, I think this also segues to your background because. Uh, and, and let me introduce to our audience um, some information I've had about you because I think it's very interesting. So Duncan uh, used to be a chef on the Orient Express before he began landing. Uh, and he used to source the ingredients from local markets. So I think that's a fascinating, uh, a very interesting beginning uh, to the story of this business. But is it just a marketing story or is there is there's some reality in that too? No, I'm afraid it's all true. Um, I So I studied anthropology and this was in 2006. I graduated and sort of got snapped up into the city of London uh, working. Didn't really get on in the world of finance. And I left my back to Scotland and I was looking at two jobs. One was a financial writer with a company called Bailey Gifford and the other one was a steward on the Orient Express train. Uh, called the Royal Scotsman, um, and I just thought, right, I'm up for a bit of adventure. Let's and it. and Orient Express and infamously uh, ends in Turkey, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's the the one of the the Venice Simpson Orient Express trains. They actually have multiple trains around the world. Yeah, um, it's oh, a, yeah. a fantastic organisation. And the the train that I was on it was 36 passengers max. Uh, they had state cabins. You would oh wow pick up food from around the track. So we'd stop at place Incredible. called Owl Shops at Sky and you'd get the the langoustines from the fishermen 
this like like at one of the stops a guy would come out of sort of literally coming out of, come out of the woods with a a, a sack full of mushrooms and you, the chef would select the oh wow the, it's a it's a full-on experience then this definitely. yeah it's like best of scottish food really so it was um it was a really it was it was my sort of baptism far into the food and drink industry <laughs> and then like fast forward several years after that uh, i ended up working in food sustainability for an organization called sustain the alliance for better food and farming that gave me a uh, a different perspective on the food and drink industry and then i just sort of dived into dalston's um after a couple of years there um and i've been doing that ever since so how many years has it been now oh i don't really like to think about it so <laughs> <laughs> we've gone through two distinct iterations of the company so i started dalston's believe it or not with a 300 pound payday loan to buy a pallet of 2,000 empty bottles and started making drinks in the back of a friend's restaurant. And I'm quite mechanically minded, so I ended up building a sort of small workshop factory and we sort of made by hand about half a million bottles out of that and we delivered that ourselves in a van. So that took, mean, about, yeah, three, that's interesting. took about three years doing that. Uh, then a guy, a sort of major investor in the, in the food industry, um a uh, sort of serial entrepreneur came along and kind of tapped me on the back of the shoulder and said that's not really how you build a drinks business <laughs> so we raised our first round in 2017 and that's when we launched into cans and that's when we sort of really started growing so i've been doing this for eight years but um the first three um the first three and a bit were really bootstrappy scrappy uh, sort of craft diy style yeah, um, yeah, which I it gives you a bit of a it gives you a nice background. You understand your craft, but um, it doesn't exactly accord to the whole philosophy of um, you know fail fast. Uh, uh, um, but I think you learn a lot from doing it that way. So I don't have any regrets. Duncan, actually, I love this story because uh, one of the points that I keep uh, repeating uh, in in the podcast and uh, in the content content that I write is the myth of. Uh, building a startup and in 12 months, 15 months, it's a multi-figure business. That's just not reality. And, so, and more often than not, uh, as a startup or, or a business like this will take five, six, maybe even 10 years. So I think this is a very real and very good example of that. So I do uh, appreciate uh, this, this coming from you. Uh, and another topic that I think really... Uh, is is it's a, it's a different angle at least because we have a lot of guests who are in digital businesses and the pace of a digital business might be different but uh you of course have a digital end but the business itself is uh, is much more than that so what does a day uh in a stereotypical day in your life uh, look like what type of problems you are you solving versus a fully digital founder i wonder right so yeah there's a lot of obviously a lot of differences with with having a physical product like ours and the advantage of the early days when we were producing ourselves and distributing ourselves is that um we had immediate cash flow so we we always knew we could make and sell our product it got to a point we just couldn't make it fast enough and then you enter a capex problem of how do you scale up your production um what do you outsource um I imagine we, I imagine tech startup founders and I deal with uh, deal with extremely different issues. Um, we, my typical day involves dealing with maybe five suppliers who are absolutely critical to the business. So um, when you're a, a like an independent company like Dalston's operating in food and drink, you're really part of a supply chain and you are one small part of a supply chain. We work with farmers in the UK. We work with a fantastic citrus processor in Sicily. Um, we work with a, um, a, an aroma producer in, in, in Germany. Now we have to make sure that our ingredients get to the right place at the right time. And honestly, with what's been going on um, all over the world over the last 18 months, and then quite specifically in the UK in the last six, 12 months, uh, just supply chain management is, is a big part of the job, right? And it's been a, a more critical part of the job than ever. Um, so the, 
the biggest difference is going to be we deal with physical goods. Um, uh, I, I, I would imagine, I don't, I don't really know what uh, most tech founders do. I don't think you can probably lump them all into one bracket, but... I mean, it's a physically, it's a more active job. I'm, I'm guessing from from your end, and the biggest difference is you have to have face to face conversations with yeah. a lot of people, and uh, build trust, uh, build an yeah. honest relationship, uh, yeah. and and that's actually the, the, is, is key uh, to the success of the business. Yeah. In the digital founder, they are um, uh, it's it's, I mean, uh, more interchangeable relationships. I, I I feel in a way. So I deal with some tech startups some tech businesses obviously there's some fantastic platforms out there um some of which we try out and it does kind of weird me out when i bounce up against an obviously automated sales funnel customer management funnel type mm. setup like um it it feels so different to the types of relationship i have with some of our some of our suppliers who I've been dealing with for like five, six years, you know, um, very different types of conversations. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> typical day to day, I mean, as a founder, you're, you're, I, I imagine there's a, a, a degree of commonality in that, like we're always juggling. Um, you do feel like you're spinning plates. Um, I hate to say it, but I think the founders, task is often to do a lot of jobs that they're not very good at until you can actually resource your team and surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And yeah, I would agree. This is the same, uh, the, probably this, the, the most similar dynamic. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, stock management, we're dealing with you know hundreds of orders a week. Um, forecasting is a big part of what we do. Um, and then just stakeholder management. But I I imagine another similar area is is dealing with shareholders, um, and you know that's been one of the one of the sort of richest experiences for me. Uh, mm. One of the most fulfilling, so. and one of the most high pressure, frankly. Um, how so? As in, um, just w what's that whole uh, experience been like? I mean, yeah, I mean, wh why do you think that was rich? Um... So, the process, like fundraising, is. Uh, can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, it can also be a bit nonstop. <clears throat> but through the process of raising investment for Dawson's, I have met simply the most fantastic people. <laughs> I've met some of the most um, sort of interesting, unusual characters that I've ever met in my life. And I've learned a lot from them. Um, I've sort of found counsel and advice uh, from un unexpected, uh, unexpected areas, but like, my shareholder group has just been sort of phenomenal in helping build the business really yes obviously in terms of capital but also just learning from their experience and being able to access their network um and also personal advice frankly um and support yeah uh you're a solo founder is that right that is the, you you are correct. Have you ever thought of uh, having sec a second or a third person on board and sharing some of the company? Because that's a lot of, I, I see people following that route. Sometimes you, build, you start building a business by yourself, but once things go, it's actually a very good offer for other people to join in and it actually solves a lot of problems. Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, and 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 the fact is, actually, I uh, I'm not really a solo founder. So for the last um, four years, I have had um, effectively a co-founder in the form of Dan Broughton, who mm. has brought just a huge amount of talent and expertise to the business, and who's largely responsible for our success over the last four years. So, um, like, yes and no. Yeah, <laughs> I see. Mm. Um, uh, he was sort of brought in as as managing director and has just become so much more than that to the company. Pre-funding and post-funding, uh, how was life different for the business and you? <clears throat> so, <laughs> I mean, do you remember? Sometimes these things remain as a feeling and, and that's, uh, I think, the most interesting bit. I mean, was there a change of gears, change of pace? Yeah, I mean, uh, pre-funding, yeah. we were running a small factory that was pretty much at capacity um, with a very small team working very long hours. Um, so we created this kind of problem for ourselves. 
um, post funding, we built a more scalable, more sustainable business model. So really night and day, um, absolutely night and day. Now it wasn't like this instant, like click, you got the money, you're able to move to something different. You know, we had to build it. We had to. It's not the money itself that solves the problems, but it's you applying the money. So you still have a lot of things to do with, with funding as well. Yeah, you got to make mistakes. You got to iterate. You've got to. That's where you learn to fail fast, and that's where you learn to to improve. And um, that's where I think you you get more relentless about improving your product and improving your service at the point where you take on money. I think prior to that, you found something that's kind of working. Um, but maybe you've also reached the cap of that particular section of the market that you're able to tap at that price point, say. Um, and that has always been a it's always been a fundamental dynamic for us in soft drinks. So, you know, sometimes in my darker moments, I look back and think, why did we pick this particular area of soft drinks? Because we are operating in a mature market dominated by large players. And what that means is there is a pricing reality to what we do. We are competing with organizations that can afford enormous economies of scale and who can push the price down and who can come with very large marketing budgets. So we have to try and exist in that, uh, in those uh, dynamics, which is possible but challenging. I have a few friends who work in giants like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and uh, my wife actually works in competition. So. This is, uh, uh, this is a conversation we've had a lot about the dominant market positions of uh, beverage leaders. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's not a conversation that happens in many households, I think, but <laughs> we tend to have the, those conversations. Um, and it's an incredibly difficult space, uh, the space you're in. Uh, because I think in, in terms of the flavor and the, what goes in the can versus the infrastructure of, of a company like Coca-Cola, for example, to just anything outside the drink itself, the can itself, the distribution, the packaging, the relationship, the sales infrastructure, that's the whole uh, competitive advantage they have, right? It's, it's very yeah. difficult to compete with them. 100%. So what we do is we focus on what's inside the can. Yeah. Uh, I was actually at a talk. With and that's them. a good point. Because of that, I think they ignore the inside of the can, but I as a consumer want the inside of the can. That's yes. why, I, like, that's why your business is valuable to me as a consumer. Yeah, I mean, that's music to my ears, right? Because we, and <laughs> I'm under constant pressure to reduce the, our cogs, right? My my cost of goods. We need to improve our margins. We must reduce our cost of goods as part of that. But the one area that I'm really loath to do that in is the the cost of the actual ingredients that we're using, because we are buying what I would say our best in class ingredients from best in class producers. Now that means often small British farms who are operating with sustainable farming methods. So over the last 12 months, we've bought a small field's worth of rhubarb from a wonderful farm in Hereford that we work directly with. Um, mm -hmm. We bought many tons of elderflower extract that's hand harvested in uh, a, an organic farm, again, in like North uh, West Hereford. Um, like we go to great lengths to find fantastic ingredients and then try and present them simply and make great tasting drinks. And it's by doing that that we've managed to get this balance of making something that tastes great, that is um, uh, lower calorie and all natural. So obviously that's my sales pitch, but you know the, the focus for me has always been on first and foremost, what's inside the can, the ingredients we use, the supply chain, working with those farms um, and it's taken me to wonderful places. I mean, I got to sit down with the two daughters uh, that run a fourth generation family um, citrus processor in Sicily that we work with mm. um, and the, the mother and father who are in their eighties, um, uh, they're just sort of sat and listened to the conversation. It was quite a humbling experience and just an absolutely beautiful place. Um, I mean, this is what this is the kind of thing that for me makes it all worthwhile, and I think we need to draw it out more in our in our marketing. So yeah, first is what goes inside, and the second is is the design, the the thing that grabs the eye. And I think our um, you know when we raised money, our first round, the first thing that we spent real money on was on uh, a rebrand. It was on design work. Kept the name. Kept the well. At that point, we were Dalston Cola Company, and we we changed just to Dalston's. Um, as it turns out, people don't really want an alternative cola. Yeah, I, I think that's why it's indeed. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, what's inside, what's inside first and foremost, then what's immediately around it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's how do you compete with that enormous distribution marketing uh, machine? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the challenge in front of us, but it's a fun challenge. You know, the soft drinks industry is a, it's a fun place to work, high pressure, um, but there's loads of opportunity and a lot of fun to be had, I'd say. Are you considering a subscription model by any chance? Man, e-commerce. Right. So we've been approached by Amazon Vendor. That's the, I think the big opportunity and um, uh, opportunity for us yeah. in, uh, um, uh, in the short term. Um, yes, we are considering a subscription model um, and we do need to get that in place. But um, yeah, e-commerce for us has been, uh, has been interesting because everybody rushed to it. Uh, over the last 18 months and it's caused problem i mean there's been cardboard shortages um yeah that's the that's the least of, that's the least of it but, i mean it's a, it's a difficult problem i realize uh, but we consumers have to be exposed to your brand somewhere right uh when you go into a shop like the, the competitive disadvantage of a brand like yours for example is to compete for the same shelf space yes with a brand like coca-cola etc Uh, but now, because everything is online, I mean, at least most of it, I, I still go to shops and buy physically, but I would say that's now a uh, lower proportion of my purchasing uh, time spent uh, physically. Uh, a bigger proportion is online. So it, it turns into a question of, and like this is perhaps a feedback that might possibly be useful for the business, I don't know, from a consumer point of view, is it's about building habit. If I like the flavor, Then, I'm, then it means it's, it's kind of like a confirmation for me to say, yes, I want this in my life, right? I yeah. want this in my life. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to remember to pick up a, a enough number of drinks every time and go online because it's like it's costly to do that as well. So yeah. I, as a user, would be very interested in a model where I would be sent a, uh, a discovery pack uh, for free or at a discount. And then if I like it, I simply click on a form And then I sign up uh, as uh, as a subscription, and then I have six or I don't know ten drinks a month uh, that comes by. So this might be a way uh, to growth, one of the possible ways. Just a humble feedback. Perhaps it's not useful, but perhaps it's worth exploring. It's extremely uh, useful to be reminded. It is it is something which I absolutely need to address. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, a part of it for me is. I want to spend more on digital marketing in the right way. Um, and we might be about to go through a small investment round, a uh, big part of which is uh, we'll be um, uh, starting to market Dalston's really for the first time. I mean, we've never spent, we've not spent any money on marketing historically, believe yeah. it or not. Um, and I think we are, we are now poised to do so. I think part of the reason that we haven't pushed out previously is that we, did use refined sugar, you know, and we were, um, we were sort of, I would say probably a, around about double the calories that we are now. Um, but we are now in this position where instead of just being a, uh, a, one, a once in a while treat, I think you can, you can drink, you can drink our drinks now on a sort of more regular basis. Mm. Um, so it can be a sort of everyday treat. So absolutely. I hear what you're saying. Subscription model. Um, yeah maybe want to pick your brains about that a little bit more anytime so my final question to you what is the next big milestone for the business right is, is it the transition to digital is it uh is it the subs perhaps it's the subscription model for you i don't know i i don't think this is the next big phase no, no, um, no. honestly the last 18 months have been challenging for so many people in our industry um This year we're seeing as a stabilization year and what I really want to do is just get the company back on track and back into great growth in 2022. So we'll do an amount of growth, but we were hitting from 2017, we were hitting triple digit growth for um, two or three years. Um, and that's where I want to be. Again, I want to get us back on, back on that track and, While online and e-commerce is a big part of that, it's not the only way that we're going to be able to do this. So we have a multi-channel approach. We're available through retail. We're available in health food shops and yes, hospitality, which has obviously struggled, but 
um, a big part, a, a big part um, of the the next step for us is is really cementing our foothold in retail and starting to market more effectively to retail retail consumers. So that's fantastic. I mean, I'm on the shop.lastens.com uh, website and and you ordered myself uh, a I think a 23 pack of lemon soda and then we'll try your drinks and I would urge our listeners to give that a go because it seems uh, like a good idea, uh, br- brilliantly executed since the growing business. And Duncan, thank you very much for this chat. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. You're welcome, Azan. It's really good to talk. Thank you for making the time.